What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then hello. My name is Erica and it's an absolute pleasure to have you joining me today on the channel. Because for today's video, as you can see from the title, we are going to be chatting about all things Sophocles context. Okay, I am so thrilled to be finally giving you guys one of the most famous tragedians from all of ancient Greece, from all time, really. I mean, this man is phenomenal. But before we can get into that, please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. And now that you have so kindly joined this nerdy little corner of the internet, let's get into today's video. So, Sophocles was born in 496 BC in a little village, at the time, outside of Athens called Colonus. He then dies in 406 BC in Athens. Now, as I said, he is one of the most famous tragedians of all time, and especially in ancient Greece, he was incredibly, incredibly popular. And he supposedly wrote around 120 something. And I say 20 something on, on purpose, not because I don't know, but because I mean, especially Googling for this episode and through my own studies, I've heard so many different numbers. It tends to be anywhere from 120 to 126. I learned it as 124. My advice here is that I'm just gonna let you guys know, whatever your teacher says, go with that if you're a student. And if not, whatever book you're reading, just go with that. But he wrote 120 something tragedies and plays from the ancient world. That is a lot by any standard, by any means, at any point in history to come up with 120 something, 24 in my instance, 120 something plays is masterful. And to do it well is something incredibly special. Unfortunately though, uh, I like to give context about people and about their lives to kind of see, you know, okay, before we get into the plays, what is it that we should know about what's going on? Not only in, in this particular instance, Athens, but also in the greater world. You know, is there any contemporary knowledge that we need to kind of have? <sighs> like with any other one, with any other of these contact episodes, it is very, very difficult <laughs> to know anything about Sophocles. And I'll keep reiterating this, that it's not because they weren't incredibly prominent people, but just because they don't write about themselves, right? They're writing stories to entertain in this particular instance. And because of that, they're not sitting there going, oh, I did this today, oh, I ate breakfast doing it. We have to infer a lot about the lives of these people. And that comes in a multitude of different ways. So just again, so that you guys know before we go into any of this stuff, it's usually reference from other people. We'll get stories or caricatures. Oftentimes they are depicted in other people's works and we can kind of take a little bit from that to kind of construct who they are. Maybe possibly there are characters or situations in their plays that might help us. I said this with Aeschylus in his context episode. We kind of go with a lot of that with him. We do that with a number of other people as well. But also we do it a lot with what's kind of going on at the time. So if there's a war, for example, we know that probably when we're talking about men, they were fighting in that because that's how the society worked and those sorts of things. Unfortunately, we do not have any kind of big biography about anybody and Sophocles is no exception. So I'm not gonna go into all of the details that we have inferred about Sophocles just because they are so here and there. But there are a couple of things that are pointers, which I will mention. For example, we know that he's from a wealthy family and that's because he wouldn't have had the life that he had without coming from a wealthy family. In order to be such a distinguished man, not only in the theater, which obviously he was and we'll get to, but also with the state. I mean, he was somebody that was very, very highly regarded. He noted as being quite charming, quite a relaxed person. People like being around him. So people in incredible positions of power really liked him. You can't get to that point in the ancient world without being wealthy and without having the correct education in order to get you there. So we know that he was probably wealthy, grew up wealthy because there's no rags to riches story from the ancient world as much as we would love that. Uh, it's just not a society that is made for that. I guess the last piece of context that is important is that he did die right before there was a final defeat of Athens to Sparta when it came to the uh, Peloponnesian Wars. So because 406 and then that ended in 404, I guess that's an important context that there is war raging in the background of his like entire life in case you guys don't know that. Uh, but his plays are again, the most important thing and his plays do not center around war 
in the way that like Aeschylus's Persians did or anything like, well, the ones that survived to us. Let's get into that. <laughs> Let's just jump there because 120 plays, 120 something plays, a handful survived to us, right? And that goes with anybody. And I always want to make that clear. We're hearing this about in reference and we know that everything that has survived to us, we've only gotten the absolute tip of the iceberg. So anytime that you're reading something, you've got to understand that that person probably wrote X amount of other books or they were referencing other books that don't survive. About 97% of what was published in the ancient world does not survive to us today. But 120 something is important because we can then group that in order to figure out how many times he was entered in theatrical competitions in the ancient world. So if you didn't know, theater plays are pushed into groups of four. So you have to have three dramas and then one satire to like lighten the mood, right? This is how you would perform them. We, for a long time, I mean, this is still something that is, is still moving with our understanding of the ancient world. We used to just think it was three. Now we understand it was four, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what we know. So if we group them together in fours, it means that of his 120 something plays, if we go with 124, like I said, with my teachers, that tends to be the case. Then it means that he would have been entered in theatrical competitions for these plays around 30 times. So 30 different entries throughout his life. Of those 30, we have reference to wins of at least 24 of those entries. That is astronomical. I mean, that is insane. That shows you how popular he was at the time. So even though now as a classicist, I'm saying to you, he's unbelievably important and like everything that he did really does set the tone for how people attack theater and attack plays and attack storytelling in general. That's not because I'm just a nerd. <laughs> That's because at the time people even thought, holy shit, what is this man doing? So let's break this down then. What are the plays that survive to us? What are the most important plays that survive to us from Sophocles? Again, as I said, only a handful survive, but the two most important ones that you need to know for this video, in case you're just watching this and then fucking off to do whatever it is that you wanna do in your spare time, I appreciate you spent any time with me at all, but the two plays are Antigone and Oedipus Rex. Now these are actually not part of the same uh, compilation, so what I'm looking for. They're not part of the same compilation of plays, even though we oftentimes will put these two as well as Oedipus Colonus, which is our third one. It's not one of the most important ones, but it is one of them together. Uh, they weren't actually performed together. They're just all the plays that we have that survive from the same location. Did I just overly confuse you? Possibly. But when it comes to his theater career, why was he so innovative? Why were these plays so amazing? Because if you think about it, from the outside looking in, he wasn't doing anything different from Aeschylus, right? I think we can all agree. Aeschylus also took mythological characters and he wrote about them and he presented them on a stage and he did it in this incredible way that broke the audience's hearts, that made them feel something, that gave them this like cathartic release. So why was Sophocles so different? Okay, so Sophocles is taking mythological characters, but what Sophocles did on another level to Aeschylus was really, I mean, on an analysis level, his plays are magnificent because he did real commentaries of society. He was really sitting there trying to hold up a mirror to the audience to say, this is a safe distance for you to do this, but what are we asking people to do by establishing this rule or by acting in this way? Antigone is the perfect example of that. I mean, I can't even imagine sitting in the audience when Antigone was performed for the first time. Everybody must have been literally gagging. Oh, what I would do to go back to a moment in time to see a play, it would probably be that. So yes, he's making these incredible commentaries of society at the time, but again, not necessarily special. It's done in a very special way because no one had done it before him. He comes right after Aeschylus and after him comes Euripides. Well, Euripides is really a contemporary of him, but sort of in the order, Sophocles is a bit older than Euripides. So context there. But more than that, what Sophocles did that was really unique was coming off the back end of Aeschylus, Aeschylus had produced these trilogies, where as you guys know who watched that series that I did, when you read one of the plays out of context, it's good, but there's no like, end <laughs> you know that you know either you're reading the last play when it comes to seven against thebes or you're reading prometheus bound which is the first play in a trilogy 
You know that there are other things that you've missed from not having those plays survive or from not being able to see those plays, right? The play is great, but it's incomplete. And Sophocles really took the art of playwriting and made each of his plays so incredible and this little microcosm of the entire, I guess the society, but also his trilogy. So his trilogies could survive as standalones and that's why they're so popular to perform today. You know, you don't see troops going around performing Prometheus Bound. As much as I would love them to, because I think it's a great play, they don't do that. Theatre groups frequently take Antigone or take Oedipus Rex and perform those stories because as standalone plays, they are brilliant. And no one had done that before. I know nowadays we have plays that are just like one-offs and that's great. You know, Hades Town or name another play, Hamilton, there we go. Okay, you know, those plays are all one-offs. You don't go see Hamilton and then have to go see another one and get see another one in order to get the whole story. But at the time it had never been done. So he's doing something incredibly innovative with the theatre that people are going, this is really cool. I can walk away from that and I can say, I've seen this story because he's, see, he's, he's gotten these small stories. He's really the guy that mastered a series is what I'm trying to tell you. He's got these little stories in amongst the biggest story and it's just mind blowing. Now, not only that, but he also completely revamped what the theatre looked like. Not obviously the building, you can't really change that. But when it comes to what a theatre production looked like, Sophocles really turned a lot of what was being done on its head. Now, prior to him, Aeschylus had this dynamic of having two characters on stage with the chorus. The chorus tends to be around 12 people. And then you have these two actors that will then go off stage, change masks, come back on as a different person. So we won't have more than two speaking parts on stage at a time in Aeschylus. I know I wasn't really stressing that in any of my summaries, but it's important that you guys know that when you watch it, two characters at a time, two speaking roles at a time, that's it. When it comes to Sophocles, this man was sitting there looking at Aeschylus' plays going, that's great, but what if I add a third? So simple, but it opens up the action to so much. You can then triangulate somebody in, like that's, it, it sounds so ridiculous. I know people are literally listening to this going, Erica, have you never been to the West End? I have, obviously. But think about how crazy this was gonna be at the time, that he went, I've got a third part, we're gonna have a third speaking part, and the chorus is going to interact more as a character, rather than as sort of like, you know, a citizen body or something like that, which is what they were used for in Aeschylus. Sophocles decides that actually they're gonna be much more interactive as the chorus. So again, we're changing the landscape of theatre. So there was so much excitement in going to see a Sophocles play. It wasn't just the story. It wasn't just the trilogy. It wasn't just then the satire play. It wasn't just any of that stuff. It was the whole Sophocles experience that he gave you. So really an incredible, incredible man. Now, if you're one of the people who's watching this because you're taking a theatre class or because maybe you're reading in philosophy, you will know that this isn't just me saying it, but Aristotle himself decided that Oedipus Rex, Oedipus the King, was the most perfect piece of theater ever created. And he uses that as an example, which I know like everybody who studies theater or studies script writing has to read poetics, but he uses Oedipus the King in that text to explain the rise and fall of action and what makes a story so good, which is still what we use today when constructing stories, whether you're in Hollywood, whether you're a writer, all of that comes from Aristotle writing his poetics and using Oedipus as the example. So even though Oedipus and previously mentioned Antigone are the two plays that I've been focusing on in this episode, of course there are multiple other plays that do survive to us from Sophocles. I've mentioned Oedipus Colonus, but we also have Philoctetes, Ajax that's attributed to him, Electra, and even 400 lines of one of his satires called The Trackers. So we do have a lot to cover when it comes to Sophocles and when it comes to how amazing he is. For you guys who are newbies, you won't know, but I do not do any analysis on this channel. So if you were looking for analysis more so than summary, unfortunately that's not gonna be coming. It might come at some point, but it will be in the future. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say though, is when it comes to my summaries, I will only be starting off with Oedipus Rex and Antigone. Of the other Sophoclean plays, if you guys need to read them and if you guys would like help or would like me to cover them, please leave a comment below. I would love to know which ones you guys have your eyes on because that'll help me 
decide where I'm gonna go with the content. With Aeschylus, I just did all the plays and plays like Suppliance were not loved. Uh, Prometheus Bound is really slow to the game, which is unfortunate because I do adore that play. But the RSI did really, really well. So instead, I'm going to do it purely on a request basis, unless I can see that so many of you guys will obviously have to read them, like Antigone or like Oedipus Rex. So do leave a comment below if you would like me to go into any particular play. But for now, I will love you and leave you. That is everything I have to say about Sophocles that I think you need to know prior to reading his plays. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll be seeing you guys next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.